high again. Can Scott Latourette Christianity take shape in organization and doctrine from his great work, A History of Christianity? The Apostles' Creed. The present form of what we know as the Apostles' Creed probably did not exist before the 6th century. However, the essential core has a much earlier origin. It seems to be an elaboration of a primitive baptismal formula, the one given in the last chapter of the Gospel according to Matthew, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. It may go back to an Eastern development of that formula, but more probably it had its inception in Rome. Certainly a briefer form, known as the Roman symbol, was in use in the Church of Rome at least as far back as the 4th century. With the exception of two or three phrases, it was known to Irenaeus and Tertullian, and so was employed in the latter part of the 2nd century. The term symbol comes from a word which in one of its usages meant a watchword or a password in a military camp. As applied to a creed, it was a sign or test of membership in the church. Assent to the creed, or symbol, was required of those who were being baptized. The Roman symbol may well have been an elaboration of an earlier form which went back to the primitive baptismal formula, modified in such fashion as to make it clear that the candidate for baptism did not adhere to the beliefs in which Marcion, who had a strong following in Rome, differed from the Catholic Church. The opening affirmation, I believe in God the Father Almighty. In the original Greek, the word translated Almighty means all governing or all controlling, as one who governs the universe. Quite obviously, rules out Marcion's contention that the world is the creation of the demiurge and not of the loving Father. The phrases which follow, and in Jesus Christ his Son, who was born of Mary the Virgin, was crucified under Pontius Pilate, on the third day rose from the dead, ascended into heaven, sitteth on the right hand of the Father, from which he comes, cometh to judge the living and the dead, clearly do not permit the Marcionite teaching that Christ was a phantom, but assert positively that he was the Son, not of the previously unknown God, but of God who is also the Creator, that he was born of a woman, and so from his conception shared men's flesh. That is, sharing man's flesh as an individual human being, he had a specific place in history having been crucified and buried under a Roman official whose name is known. This, of course, does not deny that he's also the Son of God and so divine, but as against Marcion, it asserts the fact that Jesus Christ was also fully human. The symbol likewise declares that the risen Christ is seated by the right hand of the Father, the God who is the creator and ruler of the universe, so stressing the conviction that there is only one God, not two gods. By emphasizing the belief that Christ, the Son of the Father, is to be judge, the creed is repudiating, either deliberately or without that view explicitly in mind, the Marcionite contention that it is the Demiurge, not the Father of the Son, who is the judge. Of the concluding phrases, I believe in the Holy Spirit and the resurrection of the flesh, the first was not in controversy, and so was not amplified, but the second in addition to the primitive formula, seems to have been intended as a protest against the view which counted flesh as evil. Although the development was in part due to the conflict with the Marcionites, and although several generations were still to elapse before all the phrases were added which make it as it stands today, it must not be forgotten that the Apostles' Creed had as its nucleus words going back to the first century and first explicitly stated in the post-resurrection command of Jesus to the apostles. It was meant to be simply a further interpretation to meet particular challenges as they arose. Thus, it clearly is an expression of what was taught by the apostles, and the designation Apostles' Creed is not an accident or a mistake. Moreover, in those few words, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is succinctly summarize the heart of the Christian gospel. God who is Father, who once in history revealed himself, in one, was at w one who was at once God and man, and who because of that continues to operate in the lives of men through his Spirit. In this is the uniqueness of Christianity. The continuation of conflict within the church is the next subhead. 
The methods to which resort was had against Gnostics, Marcionites, and Montanists to preserve the integrity of the gospel and the efforts to further the unity of Christians in one fellowship were by no means entirely successful. To be sure, as organized bodies, these three dissident groups eventually died out, although not until several centuries had elapsed. However, other causes of contention arose and indeed have continued to arise across the centuries. Some of them were healed within a visible breach, without rather a visible breach in the church, but others were so potent that the acceptance by all parties to the dispute of the apostolic succession of the episcopate, the authority of the New Testament, and the Apostles' Creed did not stop formal and permanent division. Still less was the rupture prevented of that unity envisaged by Christ and such of his early ex uh, exponents as Paul, that, that based upon love. He seems to be referring here not only to 1 Corinthians 13, but to the, John 17, the, the, the high priestly prayer of Christ, that his followers be one. Briefly, he touches on the Easter controversy, an acute early controversy, one which ran concurrently with those aroused by Gnosticism, Marcionism, and Montanism, was over the time for the celebration of Easter. Although our first certain notice of Easter is from the middle of the second century, that festival, commemorating the resurrection of Christ, was presumably observed by at least some Christians from much earlier times. Differences arose over the determination of the date. Should it be fixed by the Jewish Passover and be governed by the, the day of the Jewish month on which the feast was set, regardless of the day of the week on which it fell? This became the custom in many of the churches, especially in Asia Minor. In contrast, many churches, including that of Rome, celebrated Easter on the first day of the week, Sunday. It was the first day of the week when Christ rose from the dead, and which, because of that fact, was early observed as the Lord's Day. Disputes also developed over the length of the fast which was to be observed preceding Easter in commemoration of the crucifixion, and as to whether Christ's death occurred on the 14th or on the 15th day of the Jewish month of Nisan. In various parts of the empire, probably not far from the end of the second century, synods met to decide the issue. In general, the consensus was for Sunday, but in Asia Minor the bishops held to the other method of reckoning. Thereupon, Victor, Bishop of Rome in the last decade of the second century, sought to enforce uniformity by breaking off communion with the dissenting bishops and churches. Irenaeus expostulated with Victor on the ground that the differences in practice had long existed without causing a breach in unity. Ultimately, the observance of Easter on Sunday prevailed, and probably the prestige of Rome was thereby enhanced. Yet the controversy, called Quarto de Simeonin, let me do that again, Quarto Decimanian, Decimanian, from the 14th day of Nisan, long remained an unpleasant memory. Next is the Novatian and Donatist divisions. I put in a link to our video on the Apostles' Creed. Christian unity, going back at least 16 centuries, Christian unity versus JW uniformity.